Uh, there are two questions that came in t um, that I wanted to kind of hit together uh, because it is a similar subject, or rather about a similar person, or the same person. And that person is Judas. I always thought it was interesting, you know, when you look at the apostles, that, you know, just how they were selected and why they were selected. Have you ever looked at, the, have you ever thought about that? We know about the more popular ones. You know, we have the, you know, we, we have the uh, four accounts of the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, of course, not, you know, not all four of those were apostles. Two of them were apostles. And uh, we read about the, the apostles and, you know, a lot of the things that they did, being able to interact and uh, be with Christ on a regular basis. They got to hear parts of what Christ talked about that no one else was able to hear. They were able to see things that Christ did that no one else was able to be a part of. And uh, they were witnesses to his miracles. And such a great thing that would have been to watch Christ when he was here and doing the amazing things that he did and being a part of that. And Judas was one of them. We really don't hear a lot about Judas. The reason why I said it was such a difficult thing for, you know, especially talking about someone like Judas is because uh, we have very limited information. I dug and I dug for, you know, any secular information, uh, any information from, you know, what we generally know as the church fathers. Uh, and, you know, they did a lot of writing about the church in the, in the early days. And so I was hoping to find something about Judas through that, but I really didn't. And so, you know, we know um, some things, a lot more information about some of the other apostles, but there are things about Judas that we do know, lessons that we can certainly take from Judas uh, based on the decisions that he made, the actions that he did, and, you know, just knowing who he was and how he interacted, ju not just with Christ, but the other apostles. And so that's where we're going to take this tonight with these two questions of looking at these. First question is interesting um, when it came in. We know that we know that almost until the end, and the end being Christ's death, Judas was loved and trusted by the other apostles. But did he ever truly love or trust them? Christ loved Judas, but did Judas ever love Christ, even at the beginning? Um, this is interesting because, uh, you know, first if you look at John chapter 12, we're going to take a look at uh, a couple of different scripture references as we... Uh, try to answer this question. Um, there are certain things that we do know of Judas. The Holy Spirit left us enough information to know things about his, who he was as a person, uh, the kinds of decisions that he made. If you look in John chapter 12, in fact, when you look at John, I don't think there's another writer that had more information about Judas or wrote more about Judas than John did. And of course, John was the apostle that Jesus loved and he would spend a lot of time with Jesus, knew a lot about him, and John wrote probably more personal things about Jesus than any of the other writers did about his life. John really invested a lot of time writing about who Christ was, where he, uh, you know, where he came from, being deity. We see that in John chapter 1, and then you know, he continues to write about his life, and, uh, and he writes about the people that surrounded Christ. And so uh, Judas, it makes sense that John wrote a great deal about Judas, and that's um, probably most of where we're going to be going tonight when we look at the life of Judas. But in John chapter 12, he gives us, an, uh, he gives us probably our first look at really what kind of a person Judas was. He starts out, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Spikenard, if you're not familiar with, I don't know, what, you know if, it's, if it's listed as something different in some of the other translations, uh, but spikenard is a, a very aromatic kind of oil. It's a very, you know, it's, it it's a, has a strong fragrance to it. And so she, she takes a pound of this very costly oil of spikenard anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, and it's always interesting when you notice, by the way, when, whenever Judas Iscariot is mentioned, most of the time, if not all of the time, he's always listed, he's always identified as the one who betrayed Christ. 
It was very important for people, I guess, to understand that. The Holy Spirit wanted to make known that this was the one who would betray Christ. And that plays a lot into what we're going to be looking at tonight as well. But it says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would betray him, said, well, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She had kept this for the day of my burial, and for the poor you have you have with you always, but me, you do not always have. And so we have this account of Judas Iscariot being this, you know, the treasure, and that seemed to be what his position was with the apostles and even with Jesus. You know, I thought I was, I always thought this was interesting because, you know, if they knew what kind of an individual he was, um, and I don't know, that, you know, whether they did or not. I'm guessing they might have known some things. They might have been uh, suspicious of certain things. I don't know. But this, you know, but John affirmatively says how he was this thief, and we see the character of Judas come into play right here, of you know being the one that just you know this talks about how he just kept taking out of the money box. This was the treasury that they would have, and so we get you know we get an idea of who he was. You know, I, I've got to think that if he was the treasurer, I can't think of too many places that if they did know the treasurer would kept doing that, that they would keep him on. Not very many congregations would keep that. Probably none of the congregations would keep a treasurer on if they knew that he was skimming money off the top or just flat taking all the contributions. I'm glad we have a good treasurer here that doesn't do that. So, but but nonetheless, you know, you see what Judas was, you know, kept doing it, and so it seems like even at this point in time, that he was already thieving. He already had it in his mind that he, you know, there was this. There was this greed that was in his, you know, and, and he would get this money or take this money however he saw fit. Judas, as we would look at later on, you know, became probably the biggest opportunist that we could read of in Scripture. And of course, but, you know, we, we know some other things about him as well. Uh, not just, the, you know, he didn't just skim this money off the top or take the money that was out of the money box. But we do know, you know, there's as several writers uh, have given us, and we don't need to go into all of that because we know primarily what they say, but that he is the one that did betray Christ. So we know that he thieved this money. We know that he betrayed Christ. This is what's, what was revealed of Judas Iscariot for us. Judas was also the fulfillment of, of prophecy, that he didn't just betray Christ, but that there is, you know, he was being... You know, it's almost like he was, uh, well, when he did betray Christ, he was fulfilling the prophecy that would help everyone understand that this is, you know, this is the time, this is Jesus fulfilling this and all of the circumstances surrounding it. Look at John chapter 13, if you would, and hold your place right there. This is really an interesting prophecy right here, and it's one that probably not many people pick up on. We always read about the ones about Jesus, you know, being here. Uh, we read about the ones about Jesus actually being crucified. We read about the prophecies of the church, but we don't see a lot of on um, the prophecies about the betrayal of Jesus. So it's John chapter 13 and verse 18. Hold your place right there and also turn over to Psalm chapter 41. As we're going to look at these two verses, because these verses are very interesting the way that they were worded. And of course, we know that there were a lot of prophecies that were in the Psalms, but this one was so specific with the way that it was worded. You take a look at John chapter 13, verse 18, first off. And John writes, you know, um, concerning Christ, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. In other words, there's a person among you that eats with us. That is going to be the one that betrays me. Now, you hold that right, you stay right there, go over to Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, and we see that, you know, how he talks about the scripture is going to be fulfilled. And you look at Psalm 41, 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. It's the same wording. It's, a prof, it's prophetic right there. And so we see David, the psalmist, writing this about, you know, this individual who would be ultimately betrayed. Then we get to John chapter 13 and verse 18, and we see this is exactly what happened in fulfilling that prophecy. You go on in John chapter 13 and verse 26, 
And we see that Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. How interesting that, you know, that they should have picked up on this, that this was you know, something that was prophetic, but they didn't. Jesus, under, Jesus knew what was going on. And so, he, you know, and so you know, getting to the question at hand, um, you know, did he trust or did they, you know, did they trust him? Did they, you know, how much did they know? How much did they not know? Uh, it's unknown if he was trusted by the other apostles. Um, it's unknown because we're really not giving any, given anything whether he loved the other apostles or if he even loved Christ. You know, I have to uh, believe that at some point there were points that they probably had that, you know, that, that they did feel some kind of closeness. You know, you think Judas was there with all the, you know, with many of or most of the miracles that Christ performed. Judas was there when he fed the 5,000. Judas was there when, you know, when he did a lot of his other, uh, with his other things. But it, did he love him the way that he should have? Well, we see, that, you know, we see the character of Judas and see what he was doing. It is a sobering thought. That betrayal and dishonesty is how he was recorded. That is what, you know, we, you know, we can make guesswork of a whole bunch of different things. I don't want to go there because I don't want to add what's not there. All we know is what has been recorded and what the Holy Spirit wants us to know based on what they gave these inspired writings. Now, here's the question at hand, and I know this has come up um, in a couple of different discussions. And that is, was Judas chosen by Christ to be the one to betray him, or was he chosen because Christ knew beforehand? Does that make sense? There's two ways you can go with this. Was, in other words, did Christ, knowing that it was had to fulfill a lot, or the, the prophecy, did Christ single-handedly take Judas and make him the way he was, or you know, and say, okay, this is the one that I'm going to make this person here, or, you know, that's going to have to fulfill this prophecy, and it can't be done any other way. Um, you know, when you when you go there, we got to be really careful when we start having these kinds of discussions because I know that there are a lot of things that fall into place for prophecy. But if you remember, prophecy fundamentally falls on foreknowledge. In other words, knowing. Prophecies are a prediction of something that are going to come true. Um, if he was chosen to be the one, and Christ, you know, and he had no choice to be the, the, that one, then that immediately eliminates any moral choice that he would have because he would be the one that would be, you know, Christ, essentially Christ made him to do that. And that would be unfair. We don't have any other indication in Scripture where someone's hand was forced to make a decision. Again, you know, when there's a prophecy that is made, it's because of the foreknowledge that someone had. Did Christ know that Judas was going to do that? He probably, I mean, he's God as much as he is man. And we know Jesus prophesied about some other things. But, you know, and so he could have known that, it, you know, this would be the person to do it. But he didn't make him do that. You know, and that leads a lot of people to say, well, you know, and they, and they try to make a lot of these different arguments with this, you know, in, in talking about Judas and so forth. And they take it all back to uh, the Garden of Eden as well. You know, and they, say, and they say a lot of things like, well, what if this and what if this? Um, you know, what if he, you know, what if Judas didn't betray him? What if Judas just, you know, decided at the last minute not to take that 30 pieces of silver? Because it ultimately came down to greed. He wanted that money. He wanted to, you know, if, whether he wanted to be in with them or have a good name with them, I don't know. But he took the 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a common slave, to sell out the Son of God. But what if he didn't betray him? Well, a question like that is irrelevant because we know he did, and we know the prophecy was fulfilled. I've heard people say, well, you know, and they say that in sort of the same vein that they say, well, what if, you know, what if Eve didn't eat the fruit? What if she did, you know, but then what? Well, that question again becomes irrelevant. 
because it happened. And we can play what if all day long, right? What if, don't get involved in all of these discussions of what if this and what if it's a trap. And it's just, it's really, it's a, this bottomless pit of hypotheticals that really are never going to help or enhance your understanding of biblical knowledge. He did it. Christ, I think, you know, I think Christ knew he was going to do it. It was prophesied that someone was going to do it. But did he have to do it and have no other choice? No, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't say that he was made to do that. But at Christ in his foreknowledge could have selected someone. Um, he knew, you know, it's in, you know, and that's, again, that's interesting that he would even choose someone like Judas to be an apostle to him. I always thought it was interesting that when they were sitting, sitting together, that Christ showed so much love to him that the other apostles had absolutely no idea that he was the one to betray him. Can you imagine that much love that the Savior would say would treat him with such respect that they wouldn't ever have it? And that, but then when he turned to him and he tells them to you know that what you do, do quickly. And so, uh, did Judas have it? I wish you know. I wish I you know could get inside of his head and answer it the way that he may have answered it. But I don't know. The second question also has to do with Judas. And uh, the question is, is in John 17, 12, when Christ mentions the son of perdition, we know that he is speaking about Judas. But what exactly does this wording mean? And is this phrasing used only to describe Judas? Well, in John 17, 12, uh, we'll read that first, and then there's uh, the, the quick answer is no, that's not the only place. We're going to take a look and, and see what the other verses say as well. John 17, 12, he writes, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, and those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is, if you look at it in the context and read the rest of chapter uh, 17, right there, it is talking about uh, Judas the son of perdition. Now, that word perdition means destruction or uh, destructive. Uh, it's an eternal ruin. It's one who is opposed to Christ. Uh, you hear this sometimes, you know, uh, connected to the, or, you know, to who would be an antichrist or an, uh, someone who is against Christ. There's no premillennial thing that says there's one antichrist and he's coming and he's going to be popular and then deceive everyone and he's going to be the one that, you know, spreads all this chaos. That's a, some false premillennial thought right there that has nothing to do with Scripture, can't ever find that in Scripture. But we do know that there is someone that is called an antichrist, that is anyone who is against Christ or does something that is against the Christ. And Judas was described as that because he obviously betrayed him and uh, sold him out for these 30 pieces. And so that's what that present of perdition is, is someone who has fallen to this kind of mindset that they would do something so heinous to Christ. Now, whether or not that, you know, the question is, is that the only place in Scripture that we find? And then the answer is no. Look over at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the other place that we find this in Scripture. This is Paul writing to the, Thessalon uh, to the Thessalonians. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, and let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, pause right there, because a lot of people, again, uh, you know, with the premillennial mindset, or just that don't, you know, they don't read beyond what's what's there and understanding of what it what it does and does not say. I guess a lot of people think, well, this is prophetic words, and this is about this. You know, now we have the prophecy of when Christ is going to come back, and we can know exactly when he's going to come back, which is not the case, is it? We have no idea when Christ is going to come back. The Father knows. 
and only the Father. And we see that in other parts of Scripture. And again, when you look at this uh, description of who the son of perdition is, uh, this is you know, someone who is under um, this, uh, or who's influenced or has this mindset of uh, one who teaches false doctrine, one who has this destruction. You know, it's kind of like what we saw with Judas as well. You know, a lot of people buy into the false doctrine that the second coming is at hand. And we know that's not the case. Bill, uh, Bill Anderson gave a great lesson last Sunday night. If you haven't seen it, uh, I urge you to watch it. I mean, he did a great job, and he was, you know, I think, very last minute, literally, on uh, ask, being asked to speak. But that's what's his subject, and did a great job at setting it up to, um, with Scripture and so forth, with uh, how you know, we cannot know when Christ is coming. And this, don't let this verse, uh, these couple of verses, be, you know, don't fall into some false doctrine that we know exactly when and where he's going to come. This falling away that we see right here was when the apostate church was formed. There was, you know, there were a lot of people that were going against the teachings of Christ. They'd been warned about that already. Paul had warned them. Paul warned Ephesus. He warned other people. And, you know, when you start to look at this falling away that they're talking about, uh, you know, all of this apostate churches or this apostate teaching was a falling away from what the truth would be. They knew this was going to happen. Paul knew it was going to happen. And he tells, you know, remember we told the, the, the elders in Ephesus, he says, you mark my word that there are people that are going to come in here and here's why you need to stand up and why you need to defend the truth so much is because there's people that are going to come in here and they're going to try to draw other people out and he calls them these wolves in sheep's clothing, these grievous wolves, and they're going to just, you know, just wreak havoc on the church. And so he, you know, he, and he, on and on we see with, with the warnings with this. And so all this is is a departure from the truth. We know there was a departure from the truth in the first century. There were these Gnostics that were, uh, that were present, and they caused a lot of problems in the church, a great disturbance in the church. Remember, the Gnostics were the ones that said, no, Jesus couldn't be God because you know, Jesus is in the flesh, God can't be in the flesh, God is, you know, just God, and the thought that God, you know, came down and was, and manifested himself in the flesh, then God, that would cause God to be sinful, and so, no, Jesus, you know, Jesus could not be God. That's what the Gnostics taught, and so they tried to lure a lot of people away from this Christian teaching, and against who Christ was, and so you have these Gnostics that would come about, um, eventually there were other people that would apostate against it, that would fall away from the truth, that would teach against what the Bible would say. They're not mentioned, but we know who they are. Eventually the Catholics come in, and they start, you know, they start upending all the organization of what the church was. They, the Catholics are not mentioned, but I have, you know, when you start reading about some of the things that were happening, and you, if, you're, if you get familiar with some of the teachings in that first century that was opposing the, what the church was, it really is very, it's interesting because it's almost like early, early roots of Catholicism. Remember the elders were told, you know, every congregation had elders. It was always a multiplicity of church leadership, never meant to be just one person. But what happened? After that first century, then they said, well, maybe it's easier to have one person come in. And so they have, would have one person come in. Then they said, well, you know, that one person ought to answer to someone, so they said, well, let's take all the congregations in the area, and we'll just have one leader over them in that area. And so the one person in this church, in this congregation, one person in this congregation would start to answer to the one person who's kind of over everything. And they said, well, there's, you know, this area makes up, uh, you know, with other, all the other areas, there ought to be one person over them. And that's really how Catholicism started building itself. Then you get into all the... Uh, all the robes and the costumes and everything that came with the pomp of Catholicism, and you start to see of just how it got further and further away from New Testament teaching. And so you've got the Gnostics who started out, then not too long, probably 300 maybe A.D. or so. I know I'm off on a few years of, of uh, the exact date, but you've got the, uh, the Catholic Church, and then from the Catholic Church is when, you know, after the Catholic Church, all the denominations started sprouting up. Denominations had to come from somewhere, from some root or from some teaching. And so you've got denominations that start springing up, and then you've got denominations springing out of denominations, and it kept going and growing and growing and just becomes this monster that never 
ever was intended in the first century. And then some, thankfully, left all of that to return to New Testament Christianity. And how encouraging that was when men and women started turning back to how it all was meant to happen. But when you look at 2 Thessalonians, this man of sin, uh, this is a man that is characterized by sin. This is someone who has just completely gone, gone so far away from what Christ taught, or so against what Christ originally taught, that they would be characterized as this man, he is of sin, and he fall in the way of sin. Uh, he is the man who does not respect the law of God. He is the one that, you know, it's not, and it's not necessarily just one man. One, you know, this man of sin can be a representative of a group. That's what, you know, that was the case with the Gnostics, this man of sin. You know, it was one group that was kind of representative of this, uh, of this man. And again, you know, when you look at that son of perdition, you know, this is the son, this is essentially the son of hell, the son of, you know, one who's going to be, whose life is going to be destroyed, the one who's gone against Christ. And there's only one, you know, there's, there's only one consequence of what that is. He taught false doctrine. Now, we need to be careful. You know, there's some people who believe the son of perdition, and I've heard this taught before, that this is about the Pope. The son of perdition would eventually become what the Pope, uh, what the Pope is. Folks, it's not the Pope. We don't have any indication of that because this person was already in, uh, you know, causing all this division. Um, it may, you know, there, been, there may have been someone who, developed into the, who the Pope would become, going against what Christ taught, doing things that, you know, that the Bible does not authorize, but it's not specifically, uh, there's no uh, evidence that I see that you know, this is specifically about teaching just about that this, you know, this is going to become who the Pope is. You know, the, the, I mean, you know, the, remember, the Catholic Church believes Peter was the first Pope, and there's no indication of what that was. Peter was married, <laughs> And, you know, back when the time when the Pope was not allowed to be married, and I still believe he does not allow to be married. And so we got to be very careful when we start tying things to this that aren't there. But we do know that there, you know, that Paul talks about how there are going to be these people apostating from it, from the truth, moving far away from the truth. They're going to be going against the teachings of Christ. How the, you know, they're going to be departing from all of these things that the New Testament teaching. This is exactly why, when we look at scriptures like this, it's why we need to saturate ourselves in scripture, to become familiar with it, to exhaust it. You know, we talked this morning, and I know Charles again, you know, made mention, I'm glad he did, that, you know, we need to spend time meditating on God's word. That's the only way. We're not just going to know, you know, how do we know false teaching when we see it? if we don't already know what the truth is and we're grounded in the truth. Otherwise, we can go any which way and we can change as the wind changes. But if we're rooted in the truth and we have a firm understanding of what the truth is and we can stay there, then we're going to understand it. Saturate yourself in the truth. You think about this. The destiny of our eternal soul depends on being right, and it depends on being righteous. That is what's going to determine the next life for us and where we're going to be. Leaving here tonight unsure, leaving here without interest, or being, you know, being sure, or just not caring, could have lasting consequences. It matters what we believe. It matters what we study. It matters how we live. But if you're uncertain or if you're not confident where you are spiritually, I want to urge you, let's sit down and open the Bible and let's see what the Word of God has to say. Let's study it. You have a chance tonight, if you are unsure or uncertain, to come forward so that we can set up that meeting. Or if you need prayers to repent, if you need to be baptized, you have that need. Let's stand.